All right, so this video is part two in a series of how to run UX research interviews to hopefully improve products or websites or whatever the case might be that you're currently working on. And if you haven't seen part one of this video series yet, I'll link that in the description and I would recommend that you would do that before watching this one, just so everything makes more contextual sense. And I'll also be sure to link this particular slide document in the description in case you wanna reference it later if that's something that's helpful for you. But a little bit of context, I'm a UX researcher at a major tech company, and I just want to show you some basic principles of how to run good user research interviews to hopefully help you improve whatever it is you're doing. So in context of that, I'll be using the product Spotify to show some examples as we work through stuff, just so you can see how some of this might work in action on an actual product or project that you're working on but I'm gonna jump down to the appropriate section because in the first part we covered determining research goals, recruiting participants, and then writing the interview guide. So this time we're gonna go through conducting research sessions, analyzing the data, and then reporting the findings. So I'm gonna to try to find the conducting research sessions section, which looks like it starts right here. So basically, as you start to think about conducting research sessions, you're gonna to wanna to make an individual note sheet for each participant although different people do this differently, so it's kind of up to you how exactly you want to do this. But personally, I make individual Google Doc sheets where I have the questions from the interview guide that we did earlier. So I'll have all those questions written out and ready to go for each unique participant, and then I leave room below those questions to take notes. So as I read through the document and take notes, I can also see what the questions are, where I should be moving throughout the interview. It helps give me more context. And like I said, I use Google Docs, but I know people will use Google Sheets to quickly take notes in there or Airtable or whatever your method of preferred writing is. It doesn't really matter how you do this, just that you have a way of taking notes. And also some people won't take notes while interviewing people. They'll instead record the interview. And of course, be sure to get permission from the participant to record, but they'll record it and then they'll actually have that video transcribed and that can serve as notes. So sometimes people will just jot down really brief notes about concepts people are covering, and then they'll use a transcription to find the individual quote or that portion of the video to rewatch to take more detailed notes later on if they have to. And when you're working on especially a digital product for research, a screen sharing service like Zoom is super helpful for allowing people to easily share what's on their screen with you. And also it allows you to record. And of course, if you're doing a remote interview, which is pretty typical for me where you're not in the same room as the other person, a tool like Zoom is super helpful. So I assume it's just zoom.com, which would show you what Zoom is. You can sign up. It's totally free. It's a great functioning service. I'm sure people use Skype or whatever other service as well. Zoom has worked great for me. So I do recommend this particular one, but up to you how you want to go about doing this. And I do actually recommend that you record every interview that you do, assuming the person that you're recording gives you permission to do so. Not everyone will want that. So be sure to always request permission if you do intend to record before doing so. And essentially when you're thinking about taking notes during an interview, obviously the notes are what's going to dictate what value you pull from that interview because you're not going to remember everything that's said but you can take notes while speaking to the participant you can have someone else take notes for you maybe they're in the room watching maybe they're on the zoom call watching and then you can also re-watch a recording so you could record the conversation re-watch the full thing and then take notes at that time or combine any of the above I've found that for my needs I like taking my own notes because I have a particular way of doing it other people might not take notes in a similar fashion, which might cause me to second guess. Did they capture everything I'm looking for? It's kind of up to you what works best for you and the level of trust that you have in someone else to take really good notes on your behalf. I personally tend to essentially transcribe anything I find of importance in the interview. And then in the analysis phase, which we'll cover later, I decide what's actually important and where should I be focusing on the most. And also it's important to be mindful that if you choose to take notes while you're talking to someone, so whether they're in the same room, whether you're on a Zoom call, that act might distract the participant, especially when you're in the same room. It can be distracting to have someone typing as they stare at you or stare at their screen. And it might also make it more difficult for you to pay full attention to the conversation, which especially in really technical conversations can be an issue. So I used to always record and then take notes afterwards for that reason. I now take notes while I'm speaking to someone, which does run into those above issues. But for me, it was really a time savings call 
I think it's actually better to take notes later on while rewatching a video so you can give that person better focus. And that person also knows you're more focused on them. But if time is a tight thing, for example, if you run 10 interviews that are an hour each, just rewatching those videos period is going to take you 10 hours. And often when you're taking notes on a video, it'll take you probably 1.5 times that amount of time. Cause you have to stop, take the time to take notes, start again. So a certain consideration there, it, it boils down to how much time do you have and what works best for you in your particular practice. And when you're conducting a research session, it's really important that you focus on listening. You want to listen at least 80% of the time because you are here to learn from that participant. So that's not really hard for me. I'm a person that defaults to listening regardless. I, I don't tend to dominate conversations when I'm in them. But if you think that'll be an issue for you, just do your best to focus on listening and embrace awkward silences as they happen. Essentially, if you think it seems a bit awkward and you should say something, wait about twice as long as you think you should, because often someone is just thinking, they're trying to process what you're having them do. And then if you interrupt them, you'll actually interrupt their thought process and break their concentration, which could potentially cause them to not give the feedback that they were thinking really hard about. So do be mindful of that and do be respectful of the person that's taking their time to speak to you. And remember, don't bias or lead the participant. So in the case of Spotify before, I had mentioned in the Made For You section, there's the Your Top Songs 2019, where if you start a conversation or start an interview with something like, hey, we have a great new feature for you to check out, you saying that this is a great new feature tells that participant that you think that this is something that's really helpful or good or you're excited about it. And that person is then going to want to say nice things about it so that they don't hurt your feelings. So be really mindful of stuff like that. And also even when you're user testing a specific feature, like let's say you were testing the browse feature and you wanted to figure out if people could figure out that this is where all the genres are, you wouldn't want to say something like, where would you browse to find classical music or to find hip hop? Because that would tell them to check out the browse tab in the tool. It's called browse. As opposed to saying something like, let's say you're looking to find pop music a place to look through all the pop music on Spotify, where would you go to do that? Then they wouldn't be drawn to browse necessarily because you didn't say that specific word. They might try search. They might go through all these other sections. So just be mindful of things like that so you don't accidentally lead someone down the path that you're trying to take them. But we'll cover that in a little bit more detail as we go on as well. And then when needed, you can gently steer someone back on track if they derail the conversation well out of scope for the research that you're running. I personally give people quite a bit of time, maybe a couple minutes to veer off topic, depending on how much time we have, because oftentimes people will sort of naturally steer themselves back to the task at hand. But if they're going way off topic, you can say something like, thank you so much for telling me about that. It's super helpful. We might have some time to cover that at the end, but let's just switch gears real quick to talk about whatever the subject is that you're trying to get at. So once again, be respectful of the person. If they think that's important to tell you, they're, they're telling you for a reason. But for example, I asked somebody about a TV show that they were interested in because I was trying to break the ice at the beginning of an interview. And that person proceeded to tell me about how awesome that TV show was for a good few minutes. At that point, I had to stop them and be like, thank you so much for sharing how much you like the show with me. But just for the sake of time here, I have a few questions before we can cover that again at the end. So feel free to redirect things if you need to, but don't do it instantly because it might hurt the rapport that you're developing with that particular participant. And then also remember when you're running research, it's really common for people to ask questions like, are people going to buy this product? Or is this product going to be a success if we launch it? And there's no way that research could ever tell you that. If research could tell you that, every product ever launched would be successful. There wouldn't be failures, assuming there was someone researching it. And the problem is people cannot predict future actions. So if you're asking them to predict a future action, you're not going to get an accurate response back. People aren't able to do that effectively. So a question like, is this a product you would consider buying is a question that's not going to get you accurate information. It's also going to cause people to potentially say, sure, like, yeah, it seems like a good product. 
because we talked about in the previous video, social desirability bias, where people want to be liked. So if I talk to someone about Spotify for half an hour, they're going to know that I'm perhaps working on making this project better, hoping that someone like them will buy it. So if I ask them like, hey, we've just checked out Spotify for half an hour. Do you think that this is something that you would use in the future? They're almost certainly going to say yes, unless you run into someone that's a very honest person for whatever reason that's willing to run the risk of hurting your feelings, so to speak, to tell you something that you don't want to hear. But it's best not even to run into that potential risk or potential issue as you're going through a product. So do your best not to ask it. And if you are pressed to try to predict future adoption, that's a common thing that I hear about from a lot of people. Are people going to use this product in the future? Will people use this new feature? You can just ask about their thoughts on the overall product they viewed and the experience that they've had when they talk to you to see if they think it's something that's potentially useful. I, I try to keep it as high level as possible. And then I try to do my best to summarize what are the positives about this product? Do people seem to be having a good experience? What are the things that are hindering a good experience? And if you want to increase future adoption, you really want to reduce the things that are hindering the success to give the product the best shot it has moving forward. That's really the purpose of research, at least user experience research. But as a user experience researcher or someone running research, the best that you can do is make sure the product is A, solving a real problem, and then B, it's easy to use, easy to understand, allows people to get in there and do what they have to do. And also don't guide people into agreeing that a given solution is good. So remember, social desirability bias can lead people to give answers that they think you want to hear. So let's say you're working with a product manager who is developing a new feature. They're super duper excited about it. In the case of Spotify, if we go to your daily podcasts, Let's say they've been focused on working on this in the past six months. They want to know if it's going to be a success and they want research to essentially tell them or validate to them that this is going to be a successful product. If you as the researcher have that as your goal, you could for sure make almost anyone say there's at least something about this sort of a product that they would find useful. You could ask them really leading questions like, would having a product that conveniently puts all of your podcasts in the same spot so that they're easy to find, easy to listen to, be something that's compelling to you? Would that be really cool? The odds are people are going to say, yeah, like, sure, if that existed, I would find it useful. But that's not going to tell you if this particular feature or this particular product is going to be successful. So don't even get yourself involved in trying to solve those sorts of problems. And then also, remember your job is to get honest answers and not the answers you're hoping to or expecting to hear. I saw someone say that a good researcher has a strong point of view without having an opinion. And that's really one of the best ways I think someone could describe how you should try to conduct research. You shouldn't be opinionated or even have a distinct thought on what you think is going to happen. You just want to develop a strong point of view based on what you learn from the research. So do your best not to look for patterns before the research is done. Do your best not to have an expectation of what you think or hope to see, because then you might subconsciously even bias yourself into making that thing happen. It's actually a lot easier to do than you might think. It's something that pretty much any researcher is going to run into. So just be mindful that this is a thing that you have to really focus on. And also when you're conducting sessions, always, always, always follow up to any answer that does not clearly articulate the why. So an example that I wrote down is you mentioned that you're frustrated by the search experience. What about the search experience do you find frustrating? So I could show you an example that frustrates me on Spotify, for example. So if someone told me to search for a band and I start typing dead mouse, so I might say, yeah, the search works good, but I get frustrated sometimes. And the person might not even know why I was frustrated by this particular experience. So in this case, if I go to something like albums and then I go up here and clear the search, it actually reverts me to this different page, which I find frustrating every single time it happens because I don't like stuff just sitting in my search bar. If I didn't ask why were you frustrated, you might not have even seen that that sort of uh, interaction happened in the tool. So I always follow up to get the why, because just knowing that there's a problem is the very tip of the iceberg, so to speak. It's the very first part of trying to figure out how to actually improve the experience for the person. And when you're running interviews, don't be afraid to end research sessions that are not helpful. So in some cases, the person just doesn't have good feedback, or you can tell they're really not comfortable with the process and they're, they're hesitant in speaking to you. It just seems like it's a bad idea for everyone involved to continue running the research. 
That's been super rare in my experience, but if that does happen to you where you think you've got everything you can from the person and that it would be best for that person to actually end the interview, you can thank them for their time, give them the incentive, always give people the incentive that you promised you would give them regardless of how much value you at least think you got from that person, and then you can end the interview early. And this is especially true if you do not feel safe or comfortable during the interview for any reason. So in person, that's obviously a much bigger deal. Hopefully you have other people around you or in the same building in case something weird were to happen, which is exceptionally rare, but it's good to think about what would you do if something got really uncomfortable. And even on something like a remote interview where you're running it through Zoom, if someone says something really inappropriate towards you or offensive towards you, it's probably best just to end that right away to protect yourself from whatever could possibly happen. So don't be afraid to end research sessions if you have to. It's just part of the gig, so to speak. And if you think it's the right thing to do, it probably is the right thing to do. So we've covered some really high-level things now for conducting research sessions. But next up is analyzing the data. So now that you've conducted all the interviews and you're basically ready to start analyzing the data to pull value and identify themes, to focus on, to improve whatever it is you're working on, I can kind of run through what I tend to do to see if this is something that'd be helpful for the way that you want to analyze the data as well. So the first thing that I do on each individual note sheet for the participants is I give them a unique identifier, such as P1 or P2, and that just stands for participant one, participant two. And then I create a summary document in order to create themes. So you can do this in Google Docs, you can do it in Google Sheets, you can do it in Airtable, really up to you how you want to summarize this. And then what I do is I review the note sheets and then I add them to themes in a separate document as appropriate. So as an example, users struggle to find the search box and then I'll note P1, P3, P5 to quantify how many of the people that I spoke to had that particular issue. And this will help later on for also quantifying overall themes in terms of what had the most frequency of issue by the participants. And then below the theme, I'll put the individual notes from each person just to give further context. So in this example, I'm not sure where to find it. I was expecting it in the upper right-hand corner of the screen and then noting the participant that said it. Or sometimes you just note where, what someone was doing when you're talking to them. So a participant looked in the browse section for a search box. And I just take those notes as I speak to people. And then at the end, you kind of combine them all into a document based on themes. And as you're going through and creating themes, it's very possible you might combine themes later on or move feedback from one theme to another. That's all cool. All that really matters is that you get going, start developing those themes and kind of work from that particular point. And as far as the reasons go for using P1, P3, P5, if that seems abstract instead of using names, Generally, when you're creating reports, you don't want to use someone's real name just to help keep them anonymous. So I personally just note everything by P1, P3, P5, so I don't accidentally call out that person's name in my actual report. Some people will make fake names for people. Like if someone's real name is Karen, they might call them Amanda in the report. Totally up to you how you want to do that, but that's why I use this particular method. And then once you create a full listing of themes, what I do is I rank them based on the frequency of participants that gave that feedback. So if I interview 10 people and nine out of 10 people gave a particular response or had particular feedback, that's going to be at the top or near the top in terms of frequency, which at least at the early stage tells me this might be something really important to focus on. Of course, just because a lot of people give some feedback doesn't mean it's actually the most important thing to focus on, but it's a good starting point. And then once I finish ranking the themes by frequency response, I'll go ahead and rank them by overall priority of importance. So you might want to do this in a different sheet if you don't want to undo what you've done before. Sometimes I'll actually do this inside Google Slides as I'm working on a report where I'm just moving things up and down based on how important I think a particular issue is to the overall user experience. So just think about what problems are the most important to address for a better user experience. If we're talking about a product like Spotify, my example of the search bar where if you're searching for something, I don't know, Aerosmith, and then I go here, and then I click the X button to remove the search and it changes my page. That's annoying for me, but it's not breaking the product. It's not gonna be a major issue. I'll wanna call out that someone was frustrated by that particular experience, but I'll be mindful enough to know this isn't the number one priority for an entire team. As opposed to something like, let's say you move the search box and nine out of 10 people couldn't even find it. That's a major problem that should be addressed by the product because it's gonna cause people not to be able to access that functionality. So even if let's say nine out of 10 people 
said, hey, when I click the X on the search box, it's annoying, it jumps page but seven out of 10 people said they couldn't find the search box, I would rank not being able to find that search box is a much more severe issue. So do keep that in mind. Frequency doesn't mean top importance. And try to think about what problems are preventing people from completing actions. Those are, those are severe. If someone is very, very frustrated or actually unable to complete a task. If you're doing an e-commerce site and someone can't get through the shopping cart to check out, that's an extremely severe issue because not only can that person not get what they want from the site, you're also not going to get paid because no orders can go through. So rank things appropriately. And then some issues, this might cause mild frustration or some like mild irritation where someone's like, Ugh, like I, that took me a little while to find that's annoying. You want to fix it, but it's ultimately minor in terms of the overall experience. So do keep those things in mind as you think about how to structure your report and what's actually most important for the needs of the user. And once you're done with the analysis, you jump to the reporting phase. And when it comes to reporting, remember that people cannot gain value from research that they cannot see or learn from. So presentations and reports are critically important. And that's of course, assuming that you're not doing this research just for yourself. Ultimately, the complexity of the report will have to do with how many people are going to view this? How well do those people know what's going on with the particular project or product, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But it is important that you put your best foot forward because if you rush a report, that report is ultimately what showcases the work that you've done and it will influence the level of credibility that your work has. So if you have typos in your report, if you don't fully explain concepts so people understand them, if it looks sloppy in any way, people are going to trust that work less and it reflects poorly on you as a researcher, and it also devalues the work that you've done. Maybe you found some really important things, but you didn't properly explain those things in the report. If that doesn't inspire people to take action, that's a big loss on your part, and it's also a big loss on the part of the participants that gave their time to you to help learn what you learned. And common reporting methods can vary a lot from person to person, but slide decks are very popular, or papers created on Google Docs or Dropbox Paper can also be very common. It's kind of helpful to know that slide decks obviously are good for presenting findings in person, but they aren't ideal for in-depth information that might be better suited to a longer document. You can make the call for what's best for you and your style. If you're presenting in front of people, and let's say you have a really complex document, it might be nice to make a really high level presentation to help present that information and then link to the more complex document at the end of that presentation or give it to people afterwards. You can make the call about what's best, but make sure that you are presenting things effectively. And when it comes to reporting, they should really focus on high level themes that should be acted on. So there are research reports that are strictly informative, especially when it comes to current user behavior, where you might not have a particular recommendation, but in many cases, there might be research recommendations for actions to improve the experience. And those issues should be listed in order of severity to help people focus on what's most important first. Oftentimes I'll make an actual table in the presentation and then I'll link it by severity with the most important stuff at top to really help people focus on what they should be doing first. So an example recommendation is make the search box more prominent to help users find it more easily. So in the case of a search box, like on Spotify, that could mean a lot of things. It's telling people what to do without being prescriptive. It could mean making the search box longer horizontally, making it bigger vertically, maybe both. Maybe it's moving it to the center of the screen or to the right-hand side. The designer and the people working on this can make those calls, but you should avoid highly specific recommendations such as move the search box to the upper right-hand corner of the screen because that takes the ability for the other people working on this to make their best calls. And it's very unlikely that research would even figure out what is the optimal place. Sometimes you might have that level of fidelity where everyone says they expect something to behave in the same way. Definitely call that out as being, here's the expectation of the user. But I would also say it's up to you, the designer or the product manager or whoever's working on this to make the call about what you think is best. So long as it solves the need that we called out. And as I wrote here, research should empower people to make better, more informed decisions and hopefully it shouldn't be prescriptive in nature. What you're trying to do is to help people pull value from the people actually using the products to make the product better. So do keep that in mind as you write recommendations and as you work on research reports. Past that, when you're reporting, where possible, include real user quotes. They're, they're often much more powerful than you just saying, here's what people told me, 
or also videos, as videos can communicate a really strong message. And also if someone's running through a product and they run into some kind of issue as they're going through sections, it's really nice when people are able to just quickly see like, oh, I actually saw this happen. I know exactly how that interaction worked. Now I know what to do to fix it. I will call out though, always ask for permission from participants if you intend to use videos. If people don't want you to use a video, definitely do not include that in the report. It's up to you to keep things ethical and honest as you run the research. And I do have a link here to an excellent research presentation that my fonts created. So once again, this slide deck will be linked in the description and go to slide 22, which will show you this page, which is a font purchasing habit survey. And I'll call out that this presentation is so good. I would not expect almost anyone to create a report on this level with this much design influence, so to speak. This is a really well-designed report. So I'm just going to scroll down here so you can check it out because this is a bit different as this research was designed to be shared publicly. So they went through a ton of work to really make this thing be polished. It's a reflection on my fonts in the eyes of the users. And in the case of my fonts, the users are people that are interested in very high end fonts. So they tend to be designers or illustrators or all sorts of people who want fonts for the work that they're doing. But the visuals in this example are so good where it's really easy to get an idea of the breakdown of skill level or ethnicity or the volumes of font purchases, locations of people. It's, it's really compelling when there's a report this visual, this nicely made with so much depth. I actually find it kind of baffling that they made something with this much information public because hypothetically their competitors could use this information to better compete with someone like MyFonts. But I think this was kind of made to set themselves up as a thought leader in the space and to let people know like, hey, we take what we do very, very seriously. Look at all this research we did. We care a lot about this. So definitely check out this example of a really well executed research report. I don't think I've ever made a research report with this much visual fidelity, with this impressive of uh, design execution. But this is certainly something to strive for if that's something that's important to you and something to strive for if you expect your research to be posted publicly in a manner similar to this. Maybe pair up with a designer or if you're designing yourself, you can decide what's appropriate for the amount of effort that you put in to the reporting that you do. But past that, just one more slide to go. When presenting, ideally you wanna get a group of all key stakeholders, so designers or product managers or anyone involved in the product into a room to do an initial presentation of findings. It's just a chance for you to all learn together, to all pull information from the research together, which really increases the effectiveness of the research done. And once the research is presented, hopefully there's some time at the end where people can talk over what they heard to ask questions or even develop next steps for improving the product. I think it's better to have at least a day between seeing the research and starting to make important calls based on the research so you have time to think through it and process it but that does happen during the presentation sometimes. And research should facilitate a conversation to help people become more focused on the needs of the user so they can act in that real information as opposed to acting on assumptions. So as you report, as people talk through it, keep an eye or perhaps an ear on if people are really pulling value from that research and mentioning what they learned in terms of how it influences the work that they do. So that's it for this report. Remember, part one is in the description. Hopefully you saw it before this. But if not, you can travel back in time, watch that, and then combined with what you learned here, hopefully it's enough to get started when it comes to thinking about running research on your own. Research is definitely a complex subject, which is why it took two videos to cover at least the high level stuff to consider. But when it comes to getting better at it, it's really about doing it. You have to eventually get started, interview a couple people, and just see how it goes. If you're not comfortable interviewing people that you don't know, maybe interview people at work just as a, a pilot or a test or interview friends or family. It obviously won't be reflective of actual research and running interviews and actual research, but it will help you get more comfortable with what you're trying to do. Especially running pilots or test interviews is very common for even researchers that have been doing it for many, many, many years, just to become comfortable with the flow of the interview before they start speaking to people that they don't know. So hopefully you found this video helpful. I know it's quite a bit of content to consume fairly quickly, but if you did find it helpful, feel free to subscribe to the channel. I'll do my best to keep creating more useful content in the future. And also if you do have more questions or comments, feel free to leave them in the comments section below. I'll do my best to help out where I can. And also other people that watch this video can hopefully help out as well if they have some additional info to share. 
But that is it for this video. Thank you so much for watching. Until the next one.